Our Father and our God, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, so very thankful for your love and grace and for the opportunity to feast together upon your word. We recognize that your word is truth and that we are handling the word of our sovereign God. May the Holy Spirit take this, this time and teach us what we need to know. Please strip away that which is error that which has been poorly addressed or considered. May our hearts be expectant and open to the truth of your word, that so that together we may grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together the second epistle of Corinthians verse by verse. And a couple of weeks ago, we just began to look at chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, we ended the fifth uh, chapter, and I believe that we we're looking at a very hollowed section of the Word of God. And by that, I don't mean to, to in any way imply that other sections of, of the Word are not. I'm certain that every word, every concept, every precept in the Word of God is of equal importance but we were brought to a deep consideration of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, what God was really doing for us. I think it's foolish for the human mind to try to devise other means whereby God might have redeemed us. God is our God. He's God. He's our God. He makes no mistakes. And what God did not only has to be right, but it has to be the only correct way. And though we might take a, a very light and casual view of sin, it is, it's pretty apparent in the Word of God that our righteous, holy God can't do that, can't do so. And the price of our redemption was in fact the death of His Son. And now we find in the Word of God a concept clearly pointed out that we are justified by His death, but the testimony, the, the certainty of that justification is His resurrection, the resurrection of Christ. And folks, we, we convict people and we put them to death now on death row, put them on death row on, for less, on less evidence than that which surrounds the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fact that he rose from the dead may be an interesting scientific fact. It may be of supreme interest to the Christian to, to argue with the, the, the guy on the street, the, the non-believer, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And we can enter into all, all of the, the scientific nuances of that argument and we can become very skilled in presenting a logical case for our side of the question, you know, an attempt to prove scientifically and logically that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, all of those things can be of great interest, but dearly beloved. The supremely important consideration for us is that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is the testimony of our justification. You know, it's scientific Curiosity is, is of little import, but the Word declares that He was delivered for our offenses and He was raised again because of, because of our justification. And had the Lord Jesus Christ not risen from the dead, if Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, We are saying that the death of Jesus Christ is not sufficient to redeem you. That the price paid couldn't satisfy the infinite righteous, righteous character, nature of our God, our holy God. But the grand truth, and it's no wonder God calls it good news. You know, it, you know, it seems to me we only scratch at the surface for what God calls good news. The grand news is that though the revelation 
of the righteousness of God would absolutely condemn us in the presence of sin. God Himself became incarnate in human flesh and walked among us. He became our kinsman. He was tested in, in all points like as we yet without sin and then gave Himself. He gave Himself. His life was not taken by the Romans, wasn't taken by the Jews, and neither did the cross kill Him. And that is a supremely important consideration. The cross would kill you. It did not kill Christ. He gave Himself, and when He had satisfied the constraints of the Word of God, He bowed His head, and He said, It is finished. And He gave up the Spirit. It is Christ who gave Himself as our sacrifice. And now, the question of breathtaking importance, the pause that that must have, have stilled all of God's creation, must have been, is, was that enough? And that's the import of the prayer in the garden. If we don't see that in our Lord Jesus Christ, we've reduced Him to a, to a human, some, something kind of like us. You know, He's afraid of the cross. You know, he's wishing He didn't have to go. That's not the import of the prayer. The breathless anticipation of heaven and earth was, is the, death of, is the death of Christ. Was it sufficient? And he was heard, and he rose from the dead, and in the 21st verse of the 5th chapter, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. In him. In Christ. And though that may seem relatively insignificant to a lot of people, I am, I am positive that that is the grandest theme of glory. And now God has made us ministers of that reconciliation, that ministry of liberty. We can look at the work of God. He was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing men's trespasses, men's sins unto Him. And He's committed unto us the good news of that reconciliation. And in the man, the pagan heart, the human heart, folks, the human heart has reduced that gospel to some kind of man's logic where it can be used to promote systems and raise money and direct emotions and God knows what all else. God has delivered into our hands something precious that we've adulterated beyond belief. I state it again as cautiously as I know how to state it. I believe it is extremely difficult to hear the gospel preached anywhere today. I can hear man's pagan conclusions, but to hear the truth that to you, God has delivered a ministry of something that He's done, not something that He's doing, not something He's doing, but something that He's done. You and I have been given for reasons known to God, and surely if we, we think them through, we can at least conclude that it's for our maturity, for our growth, for our, for our good, that we carry a message that declares in grand, glorious terms what God has done. And somehow, we've turned that around to suggest that we're carrying a message that God would do something if we do something. I am absolutely persuaded that 2 Corinthians 5 and 6 are a devastating in a scathing denunciation of much of modern so-called Christian work. What God did is of supreme importance. If it doesn't steal our hearts, I am certain it steal, it stealed the consciousness of the universe. And when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, He had accomplished what He came to do.
That is, he had delivered his people from their sins. He had sought and saved the lost. He had done the will of the Father. And this is the will of the Father that you believe on him whom he sent. We believe by Jesus Christ. Somehow what we teach is if, well, if you would believe in Jesus Christ, then God will do something. Folks, in Ephesians, we read in Ephesians the, the fabulous news that we believe according to the working of His mighty power. Why do you believe in Jesus Christ? Because of the working of His mighty power. Oh, no, 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 Steve, no, no. If you believe, then His mighty power will work in you. And you have just destroyed the message of grace. God has delivered to you the grand news of this reconciliation. What is that news that God in Christ reconciled you? Now, now I have, I have good news for you. If you would accept, if you'd believe, if you'd repent, if you'd receive, if you, if you would be baptized, if you would, if you would, I don't know, whatever, keep the Sabbath, whatever, you know then God would reconcile you in Christ and you have just destroyed the grace of God. And so, chapter 6, which is where we're at now, begins, We therefore, as workers together with God, with God, we have to bear in mind that when we as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ carry this ministry of reconciliation, we are doing it in cooperation with God, not, not with the denomination, okay, you know, not with the Facebook group, the, 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 not with the number of YouTube subscribers or followers. And, and folks, and I don't mean that to be critical of the denomination or, or, or Facebook or YouTube or anything else. It's not a critical statement. The chapter begins that we are co-laborers with God. If you take that chapter as some, you know, some remote translations have, that we are co-laborers together with each other in the ministry of this reconciliation, then folks, you've missed the thrust of the text. We, therefore, as those who work with God, in delivering this grand news of reconciliation, beseech you that you receive not the grace of the God, it's articulated, in vain. That is a tremendously interesting verse. I've actually had people call me on the phone about this, this one. This is simply a personal observation. It's not worth a hill of beans. You know, you, you know, I say that, and, and I sometimes think people get the idea that what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to swing you, you, you folks around to my way of thinking. I, I'm not. I'm not. Believe me, I'm not. I'm not the least interested in doing that. I, I want to know what this book says. I may listen to what you say, and you may listen to what I say, and I'm going to listen to what the other guy says, and, and so on and so forth, and to, you know, what somebody else is saying, and I'm going to listen to what they say with the supreme consideration in mind that I want to know what this book says. Okay? My, my opinions are, are essentially worthless. They're only good in as much as they're in line with the truth of this book. It is my personal opinion that by far and away, the majority of God's elect saints have received the grace of God in vain. Now, that's, that's simply my personal opinion. This text, folks, does, doesn't say that. Okay, What the text does say, first of all, is that there is a possibility. Now, imagine that the possibility exists that you could receive the grace of God in vain. I mean, I mean, surely the, the text, among other things, says that. Another thing 
the text apparently says, is that the ministry of this reconciliation is hereby called grace. And I wonder what we call grace. I bump into to people constantly that, that have strongly come to the conclusion that there could be some there could be some things bad enough that a Christian could do that would cause them to go to hell. And I submit to you that by that much, they don't understand grace. You know, I don't understand how we can name churches, you know, grace, you know, Grace Baptist, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Grace Brethren, uh, the Grace whatever. And, and, and I'm not saying that critically, folks, but, but boy, we throw the word grace around as though we actually know what it means. You know, God's grace is that if you would listen to Him and if you will, would obey Him and repent and be circumcised and baptized and who knows what all else, then you'd be redeemed. That's grace. Folks, that sounds an awful lot like law to me. That sounds like the pagan theologies, you know, that, you know, the gods are mad, you know, you know, we, we got too much rain, we got, you know, ain't got enough rain, you know, we lash ourselves and we beat ourselves wondering what, we, what we've done wrong, we must have done something wrong to, to in, incur the anger of, the, of God, you know, of the gods. What you see, you know, what we don't, Look, maybe some natives in Africa do that. You know, I, I, but I find much of the Christian community today doing that. Well, Pastor Steve, I can't, I can't really tell you, brother, but the Lord's punishing me. You know, there's a, there's a sin in my life that I'm really not willing to discuss right now. And, and, and until I get my life straightened out, you know, heaven only knows what God's going to do next. And, and they're walking in absolute terror of this you know famous preachers promote the same pagan ideology God never overrules your will he, he, he really doesn't want you to live the way you're living and, and do the things that you're doing you know he'd like it some other way but he won't overrule your will had a lot of people write me about that question and folks, you can't support that in the Scriptures. No way in heaven you can make a statement like that. But it's a surely pagan, it's a purely pagan statement. that you, If God had not overruled Paul's will, Paul would surely have not written 13 of the New Testament epistles, uh, maybe 14 of the, of the epistles. If God had not overruled Balaam's will without question, Balaam would have cursed Israel. The fact of the matter is I can't find any place in the Word of God where God doesn't overrule man's will. And to have some of my best friends stand up and, de and declare publicly, now listen people, God never overrules your will. If you don't accept, He won't force you. And then I turn to my Bible just to find out that isn't true at all. Folks, I don't find God saying to Adam, now, now Adam, I'll tell you what I'd like to do. I'd, I'd like to put you in the garden of, you know, of Eden. You know, how do you feel about that? Oh, I don't want to go, Lord. I don't want to go. Well, okay, I won't put you there. I'll just go, I'll, I'll, make, I'll find somebody else because I can't overrule Adam's will. I don't see that in Abraham. You know, well, I, I don't, I don't really want to leave my mother and my brothers. I sort of like it here. Okay, well, I'll get somebody. I'll, I'll go get somebody else. You know, I don't see that in the Word of God. Apparently, my friends do. I don't. Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees because God drove him out. Adam wound up in the Garden of, of Eden because that's where God put him. You know, Noah, Noah floats around on a big hunk of wood because God put him there. 
you, you're, not, you're not really going to suggest to me that Noah's overriding desire was to build an ark. Paul turned around on the Damascus road because God hit him. Balaam didn't curse Israel because God refused to allow him to do it. And Pilate did not free Christ because God wouldn't let him do it. You know, his desire was to set him free. Seven times, I'm told, that in the Word of God. I'm even told that by a man who says, Don't you know I could set you free if I wanted to, and I could crucify you if I wanted to? Christ says, You don't have any power at all, and what power you do have is what God gave you, what God gives you. Folks, why is that true and not of you? Ezra had to, had to learn that even the leaders of the nations of this world were dropping the bucket and God sets up whom He wills, not whom they will. What right does any Christian have to stand up and say, you know, well, if, if you people would really do your part, if you'd, if you'd pray about this thing and, and, and vote, you'd vote like I would and we'd get our man in the White House, you know, who, who happens to be God's man. Because, you know, you know, God's man's always my man. You know, I mean, you know, when my Bible says God puts whom he wills in that place, and, and I find out most of the time, I don't vote for God's man. You know, he sets up over the nations of men whomsoever he wills. It makes no difference what you want. Now, he's going to set up whom he will. Even the basest of men. I find this revelation, this, this is a revelation of the sovereign God and I now suddenly come to a, a revelation where God did something. He, he did it in Christ. He completed it. He declared it to be finished and now He said, go out and carry the grand news of this reconciliation and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, He calls it grace. And as I look through the Word of God, I find that grace is effective toward God's enemies. Those who are hostile to Him. You know, I met one of those recently. Those who are not believing, not walking, not working, not, you know, to, to the ungodly and the unjust. And, and God declares, fear not, David, for God has put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Isn't, isn't that the message, folks, that we ought to carry? But God, God didn't really mean that. You know, that just, that just doesn't make sense. You know, so, so when I come to David and I say, David, I got good news for you. Got some great news for you, David. You know, if you'll repent, if you'll confess, and if you'll accept, God will put away your sin. But, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That was not the message. I told you to carry it. Well, yeah, but it, it doesn't make sense. Now there you are. What message have you and I been commissioned to carry? Fear not, thou shalt not die. God has put away thy sin. What message do we, do we usually carry? If you're afraid... If your heart's heavy, hey, come to Jesus, accept, believe on Him, and then He'll put away thy sin. And what have you done? What have you done, folks? You blasphemed the name of God. You've received the grace of God in vain. That's what you've done. Dearly beloved, you were never called to carry your logic or your reasoning Though you may not like the message, you see the minute that you tie something to that message, you don't have grace. If the message that I have declared today has any strings attached to it, then it's not a message of grace. It's a message of works. There are no strings. The message 
is God has reconciled you in Christ Jesus. You know, and the argument will always come up instantly. Well, suppose he hadn't. You know, how can you dare carry that message when there, there may be some there that he hasn't reconciled? Because surely the text does not say that he reconciled all. It says us. We are ambassadors for Christ. We beseech you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. And folks, that's an aorist passive. Passive voice. Not something that you do. Something that, that you allow to happen in your life because God, God's already done it. God said to David, Fear not, David, thou shalt not die, for God has put away thy sin. So, suppose David still feared. Does that mean God didn't put away David's sin? Do any of you honestly believe that if David was, was still scared, then that means that God hadn't done it? God didn't put away his sin? The message was, Fear not, for God has put away thy sin. Now, what if he fears? Well, God still put away his sin. If he still fears, the peace is gone, the rest is gone, but the truth hasn't changed. He was reconciled to God. Well, well you know, well, what if you don't have that mental attitude? Well, that means that means that God has not reconciled you. But where did you get where do you come up with that? You know, how can you possibly do that? What God does, he does forever. David did not need to fear. But had David continued to fear, it wouldn't have changed the fact that God put away his sin. God has reconciled you, dearly beloved, to himself in Christ Jesus. If that truth plugs into your mind, it'll change the way you live. If you don't accept that truth, it won't change the fact that you are reconciled. And, and that's what the modern preacher today seems so unwilling to say. That you don't receive the grace of God in vain. The word receive there is an interesting word. We bite our, our, our lips to say it can't be passive, it can't be a passive voice. So we push it to the middle voice. You know, we, want, we wish it were an active voice, you know. If, you, uh, if for a moment you bear in mind that the verb has a passive significance, God is not pulling any punches in the first verse of the sixth chapter where you're reconciled. Therefore, the receive is not something that, that you do. It's not something that you, you did. It was something done to you. It was a gift. The fact that you are reconciled by God's grace may be a casual thing to you, and I'm afraid it is with, with, with m most Christians. I'm afraid we're not really that, all that wrapped up in what God has done or what it cost Him to do it. The cost of your forgiveness, the, the death of Jesus Christ in your place. And if he died in your place, you cannot die. Whether you take it casually or in vain, you still can't die because he died in your place. And now what God is imploring is an, is an attitude of fellowship, of communion, of entering into a relationship which he has already established I believe, folks, that it's the heart of our loving God that we enter into the provisions of that. I have used the Passover that illustration so, so many times in my Bible studies with you folks that you, you probably have gotten sick of hearing it. But had I been a father in Israel and had I listened to the sovereignty of my God who declared that I should take a sheep, a lamb, that I should slay it and, and put its blood on the doorpost and the lentils so that my son wouldn't die. 
And I'm to do that because that's a type of what God Almighty would do in, in the person of Jesus Christ, that He took His Lamb, that He applied the blood so that I, His precious offspring, would not die. And if I did that, and my kid came to me and said, Well, Dad, Dad I, don't, I don't care whether you did or not. I don't believe you. I'm scared to death. I don't want you to be scared, son. Your only responsibility in this whole affair is to believe me. Well, I don't believe you, Dad. You, you don't honestly think the kid died, do you? Surely no Christian watching this video thinks that the, that kid died or could have died. He did not live through the Passover. He was not spared by the angel of God because he believed his father. He was spared, dearly beloved, because his father applied the blood. But had I been that father, it, it would have been a great satisfaction to me that my son lived. I, that I would have desired that he believed me, that he trusted me. I would have been concerned that he rested. I didn't give him much of a responsibility. I didn't force him to provide the sacrifice, nor did I force him to uh, apply the blood. All I asked him to do was rest in what I did. The text is not saying that if you received the grace of God in vain, that, that you've lost it. Look, folks, the text says that we're workers with God. The text says that God's reconciliation is grace, not law or works, but grace. And that has to extend beyond the matter of redemption to, to the, the matter of fellowship, our walk, the way we walk. I believe a fitting illustration would again be the Passover son. Don't receive my grace in vain. And he may. But even if he does, he'll live. He's missed a tremendous opportunity to trust his father. He's missed a tremendous opportunity to be at rest and at peace. But he'll live. He'll live. So as we go through the rest of this chapter, don't lose sight of the fact that reconciliation is certain because God did that in Christ and He did it for His own people. What a tremendous body of Scripture you have that those, those who believe, believe because that's God's will that those who are redeemed are redeemed because by God's grace, that means absolutely nothing that uh, was done by them on their part, nothing, nothing, no belief, no acceptance, no repentance, no baptism, no circumcision, nothing. Folks, there are no rules in God's family as far as lineage is concerned. You are God's child by birth, and you had nothing to do with that birth. Now you have a tremendous amount to do uh, with the fellowship. Now, by grace, you are God's child. By grace, the sin question has been permanently settled. I mean, forever. Boy, is that hard for the Christian. He doesn't care if he... If he you know, he doesn't care if he breaks the, the speed limit. Oh, he cares if he gets caught because he has to pay the fine. But, but he doesn't care much if he breaks the speed limit. He doesn't really care too much if he gossips a little bit or, or if he drops an unkind word. He, or, you know, he, he may plop down on his knees and, and, and very quickly say, God, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Forgive all of my little oversights, the things I did and the things I didn't do and, the, what, you know, and shouldn't have done and didn't do. Amen. See you in the morning. And, and then something big comes along in his life. Well, he was caught you know, in, 
in the embezzlement. Um, he got, you know, involved with another woman. He, you know, I, he stole a horse. I, you know, you know, he accidentally ran over somebody with his car and killed him. You know, something big, something big in our life, and suddenly now we have great problems with God, and grace is strained. Folks, do you honestly believe that if the only thing that you had ever done in your life was steal a penny, that Jesus Christ would still have to die for you? Surely you must agree that that's true. If on this side I had a person who absolutely did nothing wrong, nev never did anything wrong, never had an unkind thought, never uttered a, an unkind word or or, or an untrue saying, the only thing that they ever did was steal one penny their whole life. Jesus Christ has to die. And over here is a man who murdered, you know, raped, robbed banks, and God knows what. Jesus Christ has to die. And what's the difference? What's the difference? You know, am I suggesting that sin is nothing? It costs the death of, his, of God's Son. Oh, yes, Steve, that's true. But then I might as well sin. I mean, as long as the sin question is completely settled, now I can just go out and live however I want to, want to. I might as well just live however I want. That does not shock me, folks. It used to. doesn't. If that shocks you, it doesn't shock me. If there's anybody, out, any one of you out there, even one person, who wants to sin more than he's already sinning, I'd be absolutely amazed. I don't know why you'd be watching this video. If that's true, then every one of you are sinning all you want to already. Already, You're already doing that. The fact of the matter is, it probably means most of you are sinning more than you want to. Well, if you're already sinning more than you want to and you're going to heaven, why should it be some shocking concept to su suggest that you could sin all you want to and still go to heaven when most of you are sinning more than you want to and, and you're going to heaven. I, I mean, I don't understand that problem. Folks, I have a message of grace. God settled this sin question for you. Now, don't receive that grace. Don't take that in a casual way. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. That's not when you want to come to Christ. But that's a quote from Isaiah where God said it to Christ. And what God is saying to Christ is this is the time. This is the appointed time. This is the day of deliverance. Die on the cross and rise from the dead. Verse 2 of chapter 6 is verse 19 of chapter 5. And now I, I pick up a fairly popular book I hadn't read in years, but it says, well, the, the Apostle Paul pulls it out of context in Isaiah, and he uses it here simply to show you that here's a message to you also that this is the time, this is the time when you ought to accept Christ. Problem with that is it doesn't fit the context nor is it consistent with the rest of Scripture. I don't, first of all, I don't think Paul wrote that. I think the Holy Spirit wrote it. Paul may have held a pen, but I am not looking at the theological concepts of a man named Paul. I'm looking at the Word of God. And, and I found as chapter 5 closed that I'm being introduced deeply into something that God did in Jesus Christ, and I am then told that I have the rare privilege, the supreme privilege, the rare privilege of carrying the message of what He did. And now I come into the sixth chapter, and I find that in working with God, the area of fellowship and comfort don't receive what he did 
in vain. And what he did, he did by grace. If he did it by grace, you had no part in it. If you had any part in it at all, it was works, it wasn't grace. He did it by grace. So the reconciliation I see in chapter 5 is a product of God's grace. You, many of you will remember back in Romans chapter, Romans, when we studied through Romans, uh, I believe it was in chapter 4, if it is of works, then it's no more of grace. So I had no part in it since it was of grace. No part whatsoever. Now don't receive what God has accomplished in Jesus Christ in a casual way because this is the supreme moment in all of the Word of God. Why? 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 What He said to the Messiah and, I, and Isaiah was this is it. This is the time. The word time there is kairos. This is the appointed time of salvation. And Jesus Christ died and rose again. Don't take this casually, dearly beloved, because this is what God Almighty looked forward to in the Old Testament. And this is what He did in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We find in verse 3, we're to give no occasion for stumbling. You know, and we are supremely tempted to make that only, only moral. And it doesn't matter whether there's any theological stumbling or not. If I have to stumble, and of course I don't want to, I would prefer 100 billion times to, to, to stumble morally before I stumble theologically. Well, look, I'm out of time. At least we got into chapter 6. Thank you so much for listening. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.